Now, please, please, let me advise you. As a young man, as a young woman, grow large in your spirit. Grow very large. Give yourself to fasting. Give yourself to prayer now. So the first challenge that we have when we deal with the counsel of God is the matter of eternity, which is the context from whence God speaks. And that already affects the time sequence of his manifestation. That's the first body. You cannot tell if it's going to come to pass today. I've, I've seen people that prophesied accurate prophecies and before the prophecies came to pass, they had backsliding. It still came to pass, but they were on the other side of life. So you are going to have to deal with eternity if you are going to deal with the proceeding word of God. That's the first challenge. Are you with me? Second challenge that you need to deal with if you will do business with the proceeding word of God is that you will need to journey from circumstances into purpose. I will explain what I mean. In the first instance, you will need to journey from time and then you will need to lock in with eternity. Because God will take you outside of your time sequence. Can you imagine that God asked Noah to construct an ark? And the purpose for which he was constructing the ark had never happened ever before in time. So when he was bringing the message of the fact that there was judgment in the air and the judgment was going to manifest in form of rain the people felt Noah had a psychiatric situation because there was nothing like rain but you see what was happening was that the manifestation of that world was in a certain time sequence such that Noah was mobilized to begin to construct, begin to do something that was relevant to another time sequence. The burden of faith is that it makes you begin to, you are harmonizing with another time sequence altogether. And the things that you believe which informs your actions are not rooted in current circumstances, are not rooted in current situations. And that was how the prophetic ministry of the prophets in the Bible was. They gave prophetic utterances that was consistent with another time sequence. They, they, they gave the sustained prophetic actions that was consistent with another time sequence. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And that was the, the proclamation of the evangelist. And everything that he was saying was not for today. Everything that he was saying was for a time to come. Uh, when we see how structured our generation is and how structured church life is, we successfully became this structured because we don't want something we cannot predict. Walking with the counsel of God is a very disruptive kind of stuff. It, it can be managed with our current scope of administration because it's outside of your time sequence of control and Noah began the construction I, many times I try, and he did that construction for 120 years <laughs> so you can imagine the kind of mockery that he would have gained just because he was on the construction site for 120 years he was doing something that was not relevant for the time the reason why God doesn't have concern about the time is because his spoken counsel comes from eternity and his administration is within a time frame that is consistent to his will his purpose and the man of faith that receives the counsel of God will need to be armed with the fact that your generation is going to feel that you are out of tune with reality if you decide to hold on to the counsel of God that you have received. So if you are not strong enough to suffer contradiction, you'll be bullied into 
denying that God spoke to you and you become unfit to be a partaker of the things that God has spoken. Second point. The spoken word of God causes us to migrate beyond circumstances into purpose. The reason why God speaks is because he has an agenda that he wants to accomplish. He may not be speaking because he wants to address your circumstance. His speaking is consistent with his purpose. Not necessarily your circumstance and your context. You'll be reading the intent of God from a wrong vista if your thing, your circumstance is what is authoritative in your civilization. And you are likely to interpret what God is saying from the language of your circumstances and you are going to be wrong. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. If you still remember our reading, I took the reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 55. And I need to show you a piece Verse 11 says, Isaiah 55, verse number 11. It says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Purpose. And that's why you can receive an accurate prophetic word, but your interpretation of it can be wrong because you are trying to interpret it from the standpoint of your circumstances and what, from the standpoint of what you think that God should be doing. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, it will not accomplish what you think or what you want. It will accomplish that which he pleases. So God enjoys the right of intent. I forgot to tell you the rules. Uh, so that phone that rang now, what it has done is that it has stripped me of the anointing. That's my only limitation. The ringtone. God will not, is not committed to bring into pass what you think, how you like things to be. Many times we are so self-centered that we do not understand that God is a king. He is not a prime minister or a president that you need an election to vote into power. He is a king administering his kingdom. In fact, the extent to which you become powerful is the degree to which you align with his purposes in his kingdom. Now, when I hear a lot of faith preachers, they pedestal our concerns as a focal point of that which God is doing. You get it all wrong. Because even, even though salvation looks personal, Jesus died for us, which is true. What exactly was the purpose for which he died for you? Have you thought about that? Because what God was offering man in the Garden of Eden was a place in his kingdom as a functionary. That is what will guarantee that man becomes a recipient of his authority and that is the basis of his dominion mandate. We can't even define who man is outside of his place in the kingdom of God. Are you there? So man is a relevant creature only within the context of the administration of the kingdom of God. Because God by an act of a royal decree decided that he will be limited to the invincible realm. And I'm quoting Psalms 115 verse 16 which says the heavens, even the heavens belong to God but the earth has he given unto the sons of men. That's a royal decree. 
So since the day God made that decree, it will be illegal for God to come into that jurisdiction that he has bequeathed to man without man's permission. Are you there? Let us make man in our own image and let them have dominion. That's what your English Bible says. If you read it from the Hebrew, it says let them have kingdom. And the only place, the only way they can have kingdom is when they acknowledge that the authority that they are going to operate in is delegated. So God is going to delegate authority to us. If you go to the book of um, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 10, you are going to see Jesus delegating authority to his disciples and giving them the capacity to cast out devils and to cure diseases. You see, the authority doesn't belong to them. The authority was given to them from the king. So your place, the extent of authority you manifest, for instance, is a function of how aligned to the government of the kingdom you are. And that's what determines how useful to the kingdom of God you ever get to be. God, when he offered us salvation, was so that we could step into that remedial provision and be restored back into kingdom activity. Everything God does is consistent with the purpose that he was conceived in himself before the foundation of the world. Now, so the faith preacher wants you to believe that God is doing everything because of you. And you are so wrong and so myopic. And if that's the kind of perspective and eye view you hold, you are going to be disappointed many times. You'll be frustrated many times because you'll be expecting God to do this and expecting God to do that. Meanwhile, he is actually administering his purpose. You are the one that is supposed to align, not God. And if you make the mistake of pedestaling yourself higher than what God is doing, what you will find out is that you will discover that uh, <laughs> God will bypass you. And he will allow you to wander the wilderness for a few years just so that you can be recalibrated. In order for us to be able to handle the proceeding word of God, we will migrate from circumstances to purpose. And that's huge. That's huge. That's very huge. Hallelujah. A great, city, a great preacher rose in my city and he was mighty in the spirit, mighty in the word. And um, in the height of his glory, there's, there is this um, public square, we used to call it when I was a, a, a little child, public square. So this public square in my city can take 15,000 people. That's the first man that filled the public square for a gospel campaign. First man. And so he was, he was the image of the preacher that we knew. And the year he filled the public square, a few days after that, he died. He died very young. So I called his son many years later and asked him, how was your father's prayer life? He now told me. I wrote it down. Um, how long did he pray before God gave him the city? He told me, wrote it down. It was uh, seven years. So. I asked so many questions and then I, formed, I generated a formula. I said, okay, if I pray for seven years, I study my Bible like this and I do this and do that, then I will be in charge of the city. <laughs> I did all of that and more. Instead of God manifesting, it was Satan that did It was Satan that showed up. The ministry was attacked in a way that I could not imagine. The reason was that my expectations were built around circumstances, not around his purpose. And if you are going to handle his counsel, you will need to migrate. Your eyes will need to be blind to those circumstances because God can fulfill his purpose without changing your circumstances. 
And that's why Paul says, in all these things, we are more. The situation doesn't need to change in order for you to be a conqueror. Uh, now, if, hallelujah. I also know how to preach the easy ones, the easy gospel that says you, things will get better. You are going to be, I know how to preach those ones. The, the, the time you like here in America. I'm from the woods. I serve Jesus. So I need to tell you how to relate with him. It takes you beyond your circumstances. Your circumstances are not so important to him. What is important to him is his purpose. The Bible says, it shall accomplish that which I please. So my prayer point changed. My prayer point now became, what do you want to do in my city? Am I part of it? Can you give me a portion of it? I want to be relevant. My prayer changed. My prayer was now praying to be part of an existing agenda that was in the mind of God. Whether or not my circumstances changed was up to him. But I knew there was a purpose that he wanted to accomplish and I wanted to have wind of this purpose so that I can participate and do a little part of it. When I began to pray this way, he came to me and said, you know that crusade that my servant was doing in your city before he was called home? You will be the next person to take on that responsibility. And the time the Lord was saying that to me, you know, you know how, you know the cost implication of a gospel campaign. We didn't have the resources to do that. But at least I had gotten wind of what he wants to accomplish. And since he's the one that wants to accomplish it, it's easy to believe because the responsibility of accomplishment lies with him. You know, before this time, I wanted to be great. I wanted to be the guy. I wanted to be a star. I, I even made a mathematical formula out of the information I got from the son of that man, which was wrong. Now I didn't want to be anything. I just wanted to find out what he's doing so that I can be a part of it. See, that's how to pray when you are dealing with a king. You camp around his purposes. You camp around his agenda, not around your thing. The moment I began to pray right, purpose-driven prayer, agenda-driven prayer, then I found myself in the mix of the jigsaw puzzle. And my place was to herald the kingdom as a crusader. That was how we started the crusade. Prior to this time, if you put me on a crusade platform, the anointing will lift from my head because I'm not suited for that kind of service. But when the Lord says, you are going to be the host of that crusade, another additional element of grace now came on my life with which I could proclaim the kingdom on a crusade platform. You know, those days, I prepared a closed facility like what we have here. The moment it's outdoor, the anointing will just lift. And then I'll begin to stammer. You know that this guy was not. So I did all I could to escape every opportunity to preach in an open air setting because I knew I did not have the grace for that kind of endeavor. But when God spoke to me, you will lead the march for evangelism in your city. The grace to accomplish it now came upon me. So I realized that the grace of God, that the power of God always goes in the direction of the purposes of God. The Bible says it shall prosper in the thing wherein I send it. Not in any other thing, but in that thing that I send it. That's the context in which it will prosper. From that time henceforth, 90% of my prayer is to understand what God wants to do. The moment I understand what God wants to do, I now ask him my portion, my part, my place in that which you want to do. And when I know my place and I know what he wants to do, I now have grace because his power, his grace flows in the direction of his purpose. So instead of you hoping for your situations to change, why not change your prayer point? Because you are not God's agenda. 
His agenda existed before the foundations of the world. And that's what Apostle Paul revealed in the book of Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, Apostle Paul even gave us the meaning of time. That bracket of eternity called time has a meaning allotted to it in that massive framework of God's agenda. And he said that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, what God wants to do is to bring everything under the authority of the Christ. Everything. So it means the more I am yielded to the authority of Christ, the more useful I become in the kingdom of God. Many of you want God to bend so that he can minister to you. He will leave you in the cold because that's not his agenda. He had an agenda before you showed up. The Bible says from the time of John the Baptist and until now the kingdom of God so far is violence. People press to understand the purpose of God that is held in that kingdom. They press to know their place within God's administration. They press to know what God wants to do that involves them. He said, that's the new way of living. Pressing to understand your place, your agenda, in God's agenda of his kingdom. If you, don't, if you are not armed with that insight, your, your pilgrimage through time is a waste. Because your life cannot be defined, cannot be understood outside of the kingdom of God. It is in because of the kingdom of God that God created man. He's an agent of the kingdom. Now, please, please, let me advise you. As a young man, as a young woman, grow large in your spirit. Grow very large. Give yourself to fasting. Give yourself to prayer now.